Hello, my name is Bo Ji. We're in the panel of developing the entrepreneurship spirit. And we're living in a world full of innovation. And we see that our world is changing. I've been visiting a lot of different incubators, accelerators, large corporations, and to see innovation is flourishing everywhere. Entrepreneurship has been to some extent worshipped by everybody. So whenever people talk about business, they mention the entrepreneurship. But are we really innovating? Are we really driving the entrepreneurship drive? And this is a question. The pandemic is a test for that. So we're now living in a completely different world, this world where we find innovation is difficult, and small, particularly small startups and find it very difficult. Now, I currently live in Europe, <coughs> and I've been living in, in Asia and in America for many years. So with this perspective, I actually travel around to see uh, different uh, corporations and different uh, startups. And in, during the pandemic, I have uh, uh, you know, witnessed a lot of startups are running into trouble, lack of funding, support. And um, as a result, a lot of them start to fail. Yesterday, I was in Paris, and I <clears throat> met a gentleman, and he, he said he worked for a startup, and he now lose a job because nobody is able to support this kind of initiative. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, we are here and uh, we have a, a very esteemed panel uh, consist of, uh, you know, six panelists. Uh, the, the problem is we still have three who are yet to join us uh, because uh, various issues, perhaps technically, but uh, we will, uh, uh, you know, uh, start this, uh, this uh, conferences without further delay. Uh, so I would like to ask our uh, panelist who is already on to give a, a very brief introduction about themselves, where they're from, and what do they do. And uh, uh, then we're going to start with some of the interesting questions. Over to you. Excellent. All right, I will start then. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be a uh, part of this uh, uh, panel session on how to develop entrepreneurial spirit uh, during these uh, pandemic times and the way forward. Uh, my name is Shrikar Reddy. I am the CEO and Managing Director of uh, Sonata Software Limited, uh, yeah. a company headquartered in India, but with global presence. Uh, we are, I guess, present in most countries uh, in the world, United States, Europe, Australia, Japan, uh, uh, China, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Dubai, Qatar. Uh, we are basically uh, about 35 years old. Uh, we're a publicly traded company, 500 million revenue, about 600 million of market cap dollars US. Uh, basically a software tech uh, services uh, company uh, focused on a few industries. Uh, we have a very unique model for digital transformation called uh, platformation. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this uh session and some uh, very interesting uh, dialogue and uh, and uh, and hopefully we'll come up with some good good ideas to take forward thank you srika uh, dear ladies and gentlemen good morning good afternoon good evening on the global horizon distinguished speakers participants and friends my name is yolian ivanov um, as an executive director of the Global International Investment Boutique Collins Group, I'm honored to speak on this event with my special thanks to Dr. Frank Richter. Speaking about the entrepreneurial spirit, I would like to share some of my thoughts and experience during the current COVID-19. I used to run in the largest technology park on the Balkans following my PhD in the area of robotics and uh, IT and investment banking experience in the US and Europe. Then I had to improve the park incubator ecosystem with over 40 startups and entrepreneurs in order to encourage them for creative work, scale up and commercialization of the products. Unfortunately, nowadays, uh, the coronavirus made a lot of troubles with our distance communication and mobility. On the other hand, COVID-19 sparks entrepreneurial spirit in the areas of healthcare, 
and individual life protection? And how do we uh, demonstrate entrepreneurials during the present pandemic situation? I'll be happy to discuss that uh, in the following minutes, but maybe to, to leave the room to the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. And uh, uh, Jitesh, uh, we just started to introduce uh, each one of us. So could you introduce yourself, please? Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Uh, so I'm a tech uh, uh, founder based out of uh, San Francisco in California. Uh, my experience has been in kind of the tech uh, software tech world, uh, founding uh, companies in the last uh, 10 years in uh, in cloud and uh, in the ai world so my last startup uh, was called uh, quick labs it was an education tech company and what we were doing was we are making like software education very hands on so if you wanted to learn about a piece of software instead of watching a youtube video or reading a document you get access to the software right away and uh, we were doing that both in the b2b and the b2c world uh, what I mean by that is we sold that platform to enterprise companies uh, to put any content uh, they wanted to. And then on the B2C side, we were almost like the Netflix, where we said that, you know, uh, uh, we will license your content and then we'll go to market with it. So we sold, I sold that company to Google in 2016. And it's been part of Google Cloud's uh, go to market strategy. Uh, and uh, I would do a mix of both uh, uh, investments in early stage companies. So I'm an LP in a bunch of funds uh, based out of Palo Alto. And then uh, I'm also a founder of a sustainability tech company called InfiniChains. And what we are doing there is we are trying to make like uh, core data available for a bunch of people without leaking any trade secrets. And we do that in a very kind of, uh, in a very noble way. We believe we do that in a very noble way. And, uh, uh, and we think uh, it pushes the envelope forward when it comes to sustainability. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Jitesh. Uh, thank you for your very passionate introduction of your business and uh, truly demonstrated entrepreneurial spirit. So um, as I mentioned early on, innovation and entrepreneurship had been a worldwide phenomenon. So I myself has initiated something called a China Start, which is I had the passion of bringing startups to China uh, instead of going to Silicon Valley because everybody goes there, it's crowded. And there's another alternative which is going to China. Now, obviously not many people know how to go to China. So that's why I, I try to help them to overcome the hurdle of going to the East, to China. So we've been quite successful in bringing uh, batches and after batches of these startups to, ch to China. For that reason, I myself has uh, uh, been around the world to see those entrepreneurs and experience uh, their dilemmas. And what I can see from my visit to those entrepreneurs is the following. And the entrepreneurship has really been a major driver for the growth of a country. So that's why all the government are really pushing for innovation and entrepreneurship. This is reflected not just in, you know, U.S. and some of the developed countries, but particularly in the underdeveloped countries. And they're really pushing for that. So start up a business is really easy and you have a lot of support. So, for instance, there's a lot of incubator, co-working space, accelerators, you have advisors, you have different, you know, financial uh, support, investment community, et cetera. All the large corporations are now working with startups and to try to boost the entrepreneurship from both within and also uh, outside. So government provide a lot of support. For instance, some of the government, uh, you know, will provide support. If you fail, you can get reimbursed for the money you, you invested in. Uh, some country allow the startups, if you receive the investment, we're going to match 100% without any equity stake and no interest, and it's all yours. So there's a lot of support and policy for that. But somehow, when they started to expand, it became a major issue. 
So I'm currently the assistant dean and chief representative for Europe at Qingkong Graduate School of Business. And this is a leading business school in China. And we are mainly deal with the students who are chairman CEOs uh, in China. And a lot of them, for instance, like Jack Ma, Alibaba, Chairman Lenovo, et cetera. So uh, we had a quite success in the past about 19 years and uh, to help entrepreneurs to really grow themselves. That's why I'm invited here and I've also been invited for many years to harass his conferences in many different countries and regions. Um, so I always enjoy coming here. Now, my first question to our esteemed panelists would be, now, early on I said the entrepreneurship is everywhere. So what do you see any change in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation in your region, in your particular region, because you're from a different part of the world. We have, you know, from India, from Bulgaria, we have from USA, and I'm representing Europe, let's say. So do you see the change in terms of entrepreneurship due to the pandemic, due to the pandemic? Jetish, do you want to start? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, uh, so there are two things. Uh, one is uh, uh, the size of uh, your uh, company, I think, makes a big difference, right? So if you are a, uh, so I believe that if you're a single person or if you're small, uh, you are uh, in a position of advantage uh, from an entrepreneurship standpoint in the pandemic for a lot of reasons, you know, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and uh, then if you are in a, a geography where uh, uh, kind of the laws don't penalize uh, kind of starting a company or starting some kind of a business where you are really small, you're a small practice, then uh, you are uh, you are at a benefit. But if you think about it, what's happening is uh, uh, from a uh, from a really kind of starting uh, your own thing and not being uh, not working for a big company uh, uh, at a very meta level, you have to do three things, right? Either you are creating a product, or you are selling a product, or you are selling your your time or yourself kind of a thing, right? So when you're creating a product. Uh, it is at a at a very meta level. Uh, we are living in times where it is very very easy to create a product with leverage wherever you are. If you are in the Western world, you can partner with somebody in China who's your manufacturing partner. Uh, or if you are uh, doing something in software, uh, you have what's happening with the cloud where you don't really need to uh, buy infrastructure. Infrastructure is no more part of your capex and all of that. And then if you are uh, selling your own time, you have platforms where you can sell your own time and it's much more democratized and it's much more easy to sell your own time and it's much more uh, uh, what you have to invest is is a lot more uh, kind of uh, cheaper uh, from ever before. Uh, so so you we, we are living in a time where it is much more easier to be uh, an entrepreneur and to uh, to uh, be enterprising you know and uh, what is difficult is uh, what it takes to be enterprising right figuring that out and figuring out what what is the criteria for that mm -hmm. but in during the pandemic uh, do you see any change in terms of entrepreneurship yeah yeah so uh, what happens is, uh, you know, if you if you take the analogy to a software system, and if you had to stress test the software in a, in uh, uh, in criteria that you never thought that would exist, right? Like if you were to put put like a piece of like software code where you said like uh, this is the uh, uh, attack vector that would almost never happen, like you know. Uh, so that's what we are seeing now with kind of entrepreneurship and uh, with uh, uh, businesses opening, right? So uh, what we are seeing now is that uh, the size of your operations matters a lot. The smaller you are, the more agile you are, actually makes a huge difference. And people have been trying to sell that for a while, 
like Amazon has been trying to sell that for a while that even within a big company, if you're smaller, it enables you to be more innovative. But now I think that is com- kind of be, uh, coming to the surface. Like, you know, uh, uh, either you have to be small individually or within a big company, you have to be small. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that is going to be not, it, it's not just a, a short term thing. It is uh, It is a pattern. It's not an outlier. That's what we are seeing now. Mm. So you're seeing the the uh, smaller smaller initiative or team or startups within a large corporation actually do better in this pandemics. Yeah, yeah. So it's not the initiative, but it's the it's the headcount has to be smaller. Yeah. So uh, the the uh, I mean the people that you uh, uh, kind of galvanize around uh, an idea or an initiative. When it's smaller, uh, you you kind of get an exponential return. The moment it becomes beyond like 10, 11 in the Western world, you start to see it kind of plateau out, right? And mm-hmm. it happens even in Asia, you know, uh, and the number changes, but that's, that's the whole idea, right? Like uh, uh, that smaller teams create kind of exponential returns. And uh, how do you kind of build something that kind of, adds all of that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your sharing. So, uh, Shrika, you want to share something? Uh, We couldn't hear you. You muted it. A couple of points I wanted to make. I think, see, when we think of entrepreneurship, obviously what strikes our mind is first is this very cool tech startups and you know, innovation, you know, you know, the next, uh, you know, unicorn and all that kind of stuff. But if you see the heart and soul of any country, it's the small entrepreneurs uh, who deliver basic services to people around them. Now, if you see what this pandemic has done to those people, it has wiped them out. Uh, You know, if you take a, a country like India because of the lockdowns and uh, you know, lack of, uh, uh, you know, money to last out, inability to pay wages, uh, banks don't fund you in that time, lack of demand, your ability to last for more than two or three months has gone. So what this has done, I don't know what count, uh, you know, when you ask for what is the status of entrepreneurship, my count is that maybe um, a million entrepreneurs in India have have gone off the radar. Now, will they come back again? I think they'll be extremely scared because unless there is a much better protective system, uh, because these people are totally not protected from these things. They are left to fend for themselves. And uh, will they come back and again, you know, put their life savings and doing this kind of business? I, uh, I, I don't think so unless the system changes and starts protecting these small manufacturers, service providers, uh, micro stall owners, you know, the fruit vendor, the tea stall person. And this is what makes the backbone of India, I mean, you know, not the large enterprises. 60% of Indian employment is generated by these micro small enterprises across the length and breadth of the country. So mm-hmm. I think it's been extremely bad. And I think that's the case all over the world. You take the United States, you take the small restaurants. I mean, I believe you go to Times Square, I mean, when this whole thing ends, I believe 50 percent of the shops which were there will not be there. So you have wiped out those entrepreneurs, poor people. I mean, you know, so I I just wanted to ensure that when we think of entrepreneurship, I think uh, we need to separate out, you know, entrepreneurship uh, from this big and very cool and innovation and tech and, you know, biotech and whatever and all that kind of stuff to people who provide the backbone to the economy doing basically mundane things but providing a big service to the people around them uh, because they are the people who are creating most of the employment. I mean, I think finally it's all about creation of employment and not making a lot of wealth for uh, yourself. So if you take that point out, so what point I'm trying to make is that this has been extremely bad for, uh, uh, for a majority of what I want to call entrepreneurs and to their psyche of, you know, will they come back and will they do anything again like this again without a proper protective system? which somebody else provide. 
then we come back to the the cooler part the innovation and you know tech and i think that i think has really taken off in the pandemic as we see you know there is everything is a lot more digital contactless touchless uh, you know the people who are providing those services or launching new services in that space are doing extremely well i mean and i mean like they said in india there was a report they saying what demonetization did not do the pandemic has done <laughs> the monetization was done to increase increase the digital uh, uh you know uh, payments and digital economy of the country uh and that was a complete failure and what this pandemic has done is i think it has increased the digital uh, uh, uh you know uh, economy of the country by a factor of almost 10 so so now in this whole thing you know the amount of you know services provided innovation people so there is a big you know that part but that that still other you know a country of india size i mean maybe a lot of you know a small number of people will make a lot of money uh, but will add add to the overall you know development of the uh, economy employment generation etc so so the point i like to also make is that you know i think we also need to take care of the basic structural systems of a of a, at least a, a, a developing country like india uh with a lot more needs uh than purely wealth wealth creation as a basic objective kind of stuff so entrepreneurship uh development has to focus on uh, employment uh generation and provide a basic livelihood to people uh mm-hmm. and then you know uh you know you can overlay on top all the innovation wealth creation and all that kind of stuff so that's really i think a point i wanted to make yeah well thank you thank you for your very comprehensive uh uh, uh examination on this issue I, I, i absolutely agree with you on this on the set that the two there's a two different sort of uh, world one is the big tech world which is doing really well you can see from s&p 500 how it <laughs> went in a auto roof during the pandemic which is absolutely baloney and uh, and then on the other hand you see a, a lot of small medium businesses being wiped out completely and be destroyed you know i met so many small entrepreneurs they said that well life is a hell right now and particularly my and papa you know businesses uh, which is i agree they are the the hardcore of our economy and employment uh, which is also stability social stability offer a lot of social stability to our society which is uh, underwater and uh, being significantly impacted so this is a uh, uh, you know we're not going to focus on solution right now we just wanted to see how uh, the world is changing so thanks for laying out uh, for that so yulena you yulian could you share some of your view thank you it's interesting to to speak about uh, the differences in the us uh, europe and asia and uh, speaking for specific uh, differences on the other side i would like to share some of my thoughts in principle that uh, how to demonstrate entrepreneurship uh, during the present pandemic situation i i can say that we have to be more adaptable to use our position and uh, opportunity to learn new skill and to test uh, uh, our knowledge on the other side to be ourselves and to take advantages of uh, what makes our unique and don't to try feel the same roles as others to to make an impact to big uh, uh uh a brand but uh entrepreneurial its mindset it's about a certain way of thinking and it's about way in which uh, approach challenges and make mistakes mistakes and again try again and uh nowadays unfortunately if let's say take uh, our experience in horasis society usually we meet each other uh face to face on uh, global visionary forums and uh today we uh, we do that uh online uh, therefore this distance uh communication and distance learning education and mentoring it's uh, our virtual work place nowadays therefore the personally took part uh in different projects and discussions i spent a lot of time on a daily basis cre- uh, discussing uh different projects in uh in the us and in europe but the creative work uh, it's still on our 
own hands. Therefore, uh, even nowadays, the entrepreneurs feel more and more to be connected. And at the same time, we have to turn ideas into action. Even with the increasing number of affected people, successful entrepreneurial has to challenge ourselves to be passionate and to take the risk to trust ourselves, to reduce the fears and to have great partners. Nowadays, uh, to, to be in touch with uh, many people on a global base, uh, I saw that there is a big uh, uh, demand. On the other side, it's a boom in the communication uh, by uh, streaming. Therefore, this is a new options for the development. And uh, this is the way how uh, we can succeed. When, uh, Borji, you mentioned that the difference in uh, Asia and in Europe, uh, I can say that uh, you know very well the commercialization of the product in the US, it's uh, in much more advanced stage compared in uh, Europe. On the other side, the opportunity for funding in Europe, it's uh, in completely different atmosphere compared to American entrepreneurship. But nowadays in the global pandemic situation, we can uh, make the bridges between the differences and to succeed together. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So speaking about uh, the, uh, the support uh, funding in particular, which you mentioned, uh, 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 indeed, uh, the, there is a quite complete system in America to fund entrepreneurship. Uh, in Europe, uh, they are, they are, to some extent, not quite coordinated and it's quite scattered. Uh, uh, in, in China, the funding is very abundant. So uh, you see, but the, the problem in China is the lack of good projects. And, uh, and some of the very good projects are often being being captured by some big potato. So the smaller investment company doesn't have this opportunity. That's why I'm creating the China Start to also give the Chinese investment community the opportunity to spot, you know, the good projects from Europe and from other parts of the world uh, rather than they're waiting for the big potato to leave some secondary project to them uh, and so that they became, you know, the sucker rather than the pioneer of that. So um, I want, wanted to start to ask the second question, which is, are we innovating the right thing in, in our entrepreneurship? You know, are we innovating the right thing? You know, the pandemic is, is a offer, in my view, as, as some sort of a testing ground to see how are you doing? Are you innovating in the right thing? So I want to do for uh, this to our panelists um, to examine uh, this particular question. Yeah. So uh, uh, are you okay if I, I'll take a first stab at this. Sure. So there are two things that happen when you try to answer that question, right? Are we doing the right thing? One is uh, from a, uh, from a uh, very agile and cost standpoint, are we uh, being ki kind of, are we like taking these baby steps around solving a very bigger uh, problem? Uh, you know, are we saying that, you know, l let's do these small things. Let's be very agile and not uh, spend a lot of human costs around like uh, dreaming very big. And then the second thing is that uh, kind of uh, are we investing enough uh, around the bigger problems? For example, like uh, to to kind of uh, Shrikar's point, right? Like one of the things Mike, uh, I heard from my cousin just two months back is that if you're living in Asia and you're not even and you are in the urban world, you're in Mumbai or Bangalore, and you're not even seeing the skies, you will probably not even think about what's happening with uh, with NASA and uh, what would you want to invest in kind of those problems, right? You, you're not aware about that at all. So, incremental, like how would you think about those problems, right? Uh, so uh, the problems that are agile and that are incremental and that are like smaller, uh, they are actually very, very interesting. And the reason they are interesting is if you think about the vast majority of people that are living under like, uh, uh, they, they are not doing really well from a socioeconomic standpoint and they are problems that have been solved in the emerging world. 
and you know they are largely problems that fall under three categories you are trying to build a product you are trying to uh, sell the product you are trying to sell your time right if you are trying to build a product you have a lot of leverage today anywhere you can reuse what's happened in the western world if you are in the western world you can partner with a manufacturing partner in china if you are uh, a software company uh you can leverage the cloud uh, if you were youtube today you would not sell to google because uh, the infra is not part of your capex it's part of your opex if you are trying to sell uh, the product you are trying to sell a service you are trying to sell the product you don't have to build a retail arm you can use the marketplace you can use in the western world uh, the poster child is the amazon's amazon's marketplace it's hc if you are trying to sell your time you are trying to consult you are trying you are a lawyer there are so many ways to sell and self uh, kind of promote yourself so all of those three things like if you are like really thinking small have gotten democratized and they have gotten democratized kind of globally right which is a very very good news actually not many people kind of internalize that right that is so amazing that kind of came out from the western world but it went all over and china kind of uh really really globalized it and said that we can do this in asia right uh but the bigger problems is is where the interesting thing is like where uh, you you have to make a long term capex investments and these are like uh, bigger issues and there is a lot of lot of room even there like you know as the human population is growing is not not within the window of my like kind of a couple of minutes but uh, i think the poster child is china what china has proven is that in the asian world you can still have state driven innovation and that gives me a lot of a uh, lot of kind of uh, motivation and strength that it can happen somewhere outside of the a new world very good yeah yulia you want to say something Yes, uh, I agree with uh, Jitesh what he said about the democratization. And uh, nowadays, with uh, the coronavirus, we have to do in a global environment more and more. And uh, from one side, uh, we have to keep uh, the uh, distance and to have the troubles with mobility. But on the other side, the way how in the U.S. entrepreneurial uh, commercialize the product, what uh, Jitesh speaking, it's uh, a much better uh, way how to succeed on the other side having in mind the experience in China and even in Europe to have a uh, funding for the uh, startups and for the small caps it's a uh, uh, one stage on the other stage uh, to scale up and to succeed nowadays with this uh, global pandemic we have to make the bridges and uh, to succeed together if you look even to the our current troubles about the uh, our healthcare and about uh, to find a vaccine you can see uh, as well so many uh researchers and entrepreneurs doing best in order to succeed but uh, this is uh, something which i i repeat it's uh, important to use um, the differences between the asia uh, europe and the us and on the other side uh, nowadays with this uh, distance communication and uh, improving uh, each other uh, can help for the future development of the world and uh, even now discussion and priorities for the healthcare and for the green, uh, green future of europe it's very important and this uh, this can make a new entrepreneurial spirit in order to have bright future this is my my understanding for the moment thank you very much yeah indeed uh, uh we doing business and also uh for the entrepreneurs is getting easier uh because of all those help that you can leverage globally the pandemic uh, in some ways facilitated that and to some large way i uh, actually destroying the physical you know appearance for that and which you can see that some countries that doesn't allow people to move around easily and freely and we're in the middle of that so 
um, you know, that is the thing. So uh, I wanted to uh, invite um, uh, Srika to, uh, to speak. You know, the question is really, are we innovating the right thing? Srika, eh, we can't hear you. Oh, so are we innovating on the right things? Obviously, I mean, you know, who's going to decide on that, you know, whether we are innovating on the right things or not. I think what are the metrics by which we are going to measure, uh, you know, what is the uh, what is the uh, uh, benefit of the innovation? If innovation is going to be measured purely on market capitalization and market value and so on and so forth, there could be uh, benefits could be measured on innovation for social good, employment generation, etc. So I, I think my feeling is that we need to change the metrics uh, by which we measure innovation and, you know, are we innovating on the right things kind of stuff. If we do that, then I think uh, obviously then, you know, it's whether the 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 ideas uh, delivered the value for which it started with kind of stuff. Obviously, for every 10 ideas, only two may succeed and that's fine. That's not a problem. And if you just see in the in the pandemic, I mean, you know, and uh, the level of innovation I have seen, you know, you know around me kind of stuff, right? There are number of people who are manufacturing contactless sanitizer dispensers in India. Uh, you know, you press a pedal and the sanitizer dispenses. Okay. There are 10,000 of them have come up in this last six months. <laughs> okay. And they make in their small units, you know, 10 units a day, local distribution, you know, and, you know, sell it for like $10 or whatever it is. Right. And that's what it costs, you know, a, a unit like that, you know. So I've seen that people are innovating, making what I call uh, designer masks. Okay. Using, you know, high quality textile and, you know, with your logo and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Again, I call it brilliant innovation. I mean, how do you use this thing and innovating for the time being kind of stuff? The market for hand sanitizers in India has gone up by 10,000 times. So the number of people have stepped in into manufacturing hand sanitizers has gone up by 100 times. So I see, I think wherever there is need, there is innovation and people are, uh, you know, uh, catering to it. I have another point where I think there is also a lot of money still which goes into what I call me too ideas, right? I mean, you have Uber, there are six ideas for, you know, another six more uber like ideas and at least i think you know at a bare minimum a hundred million dollar gets spent on each of those ideas i I, feel, I mean i somehow don't think that you know i mean the right kind of innovation is being encouraged uh when when you know i mean we have so many of these platforms now in india right i mean you know and most of them are me too ideas they're not uh, original ideas kind of the, there could be a idea for amazon or a uh or, or a food delivery service. I think we have six food delivery services. Do we need six food delivery services? I have no idea. Do we need $500 million to be funded to each of them? I have, I have no idea. So I think there's definitely, at least personally, I feel uh, there needs to be some balance between, you know, I think what India needs is a lot of uh, transformation of its agri uh, business, agri storage, distribution, food processing, I don't know whether the same $500 million uh, which spent in these ideas will actually have a dramatic transformation on, on the economy, people's lives, and so many other things. So I still have a problem with where this money is currently chasing today and not chasing, I think. That's why I said you need to see, you know, how do you measure value of innovation, you know, and, and, and then I guess we can all make a judgment whether the right innovation is being encouraged or not. But that's, yeah, that's what I feel. Yeah. So very good uh, sharing uh, for that. I uh, echo that very much so. So there's a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, Me Too innovation. And same with China. When China had this uh, OFO bicycle, the, the bike sharing concept, overnight there's 200 bikes you know, on the market, there's like yellow bike, a red bike and blue bike, a white bike, you know, all kind, except black bike. I guess nobody like black. So uh, this is a, this is a very me too. And when sharing economy was present in China, everybody talked about sharing economy. If your business is a sharing economy, you got funding. That's it. So I even had a, a company 
which I met, uh, I was speaking in one of the uh, Chinese uh, sharing economy conference. And he said, that, uh, I'm sharing economy. I said, what do you do? Uh, we share the napkins. I said, how do you share napkins? You know, do you like uh, use half and give the other half to your neighbor or what do you do? But eventually I figured out he actually distributed napkins, you know, uh, so that, that's called sharing, you know, uh, napkins. So uh, that was, uh, that was a quite a crazy, uh, uh, you know, thing. So I, I guess it's a human nature that we try to, to follow other success and we don't want to be left out uh, for that matter. But indeed, so I personally, on this particular question, I feel that in some ways, obviously, we're innovating in the right thing, but uh, largely we're not, and we're being followers, number one. Number two, we do not anticipate the crisis. For instance, coronavirus has been a major disaster that Bill Gates in 2015 made a uh, TED Talk uh, speech and warning the, the world that uh, the virus could be our next uh, biggest enemy, more serious than any sort of uh, uh, mass destruction um, weapons. But yet uh, the world didn't listen to it. So we spent a lot of money on some what I call useless innovation. And, and that doesn't really change much uh, or they create a lot of duplication. Um, but what we really need, uh, nobody's paying attention to. So now we're in this situation, we don't have medicine, we don't have the uh, vac uh, you know, vaccine. And we have no cue, uh, clue how to deal with it. Uh, we don't have the right medical equipment to deal with that. So all this is a problem for us. You know, obviously today we don't have the time to examine why is that and how could we can change that. But last question before we finish, because we only have like four minutes left, we have to be kicked out. How we can help to nurture entrepreneurship? What are the best practices? I just give each one of you just one minute because we run out of time. So. Who want to be the first? Julian. Um, thank you for uh, your thoughts and uh, I, I agree. And on the other side, I would like to say that uh, entrepreneurial during the pandemic nowadays, uh, it's more important to have three very, very important things. To, let's say to be positive as a mindset. On the other side, to have future thinking, how it's important to, to be visionary for the uh, future ahead and for the next generation. And the, the third one, I think uh, the great pandemic needs to have more courage and risk taking in the foundation quality of entrepreneurials. Therefore, and especially in the environment where everything could be at stake, only the courageous venture on their own can uh, help the business in, in possible approach. Thank you. Thank you. Srika. One minute. Yeah, I only have, I think, two points. One is, I think, uh, depending on the society in live in, I think uh, there is a lot of stigma attached to failure. So, so, so unless you, you somehow ensure that, uh, especially in a country like India and I don't know about other region countries, that if you fail, then you're considered a failure for life. So that doesn't encourage entrepreneurial spirits. I think somehow the Social ethos, ethics, uh, 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 moral values, systems have to change to actually encourage entrepreneurship and saying that you started something, you failed. Uh, you know, uh, I don't. I, I actually think you did a brave thing, and not that you're a failure for life kind of stuff. Uh, that's the first thing. Second is, I think there should be some method by which uh, you know funding is made available to a lot more ideas. Uh, I think today it's very. I think very narrowly f uh, focused and, and uh, chasing uh, a lot of money is chasing a few ideas. So some of the funding has to be democratized uh, so that a lot more ideas and innovation uh, can be funded than what they're currently being funded. I think these are the only two points I have. Well, thank you. Jitesh. Yeah, I'm going to just repeat what he said. Uh, uh, so it somewhere has to do with agility and being small. The smaller you are, the better fit you are to be uh, to be innovative to ent uh, to be uh, to uh, to be enterprising right to to make that bet that this is not uh, what everyone is doing that's first and what again he said right shrikar is is capital has to do with it like mm -hmm. you know how the funding uh, movement works it has uh, it was a big difference in china i think the same is happening in india but that has to be a big difference in, in India and also in the U.S. actually, right? Uh, that the capital shouldn't be around these smaller things. It has to be around the big things. 
you know, be long term things. What's happening in the in China again, right? Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, we're running out of time. Let me say that uh, we have to innovate for impact, and uh, I wish everybody a happy, you know, uh, successful conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Boji, yeah, for conducting an excellent session. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Great. Bye bye.